Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection, the local interview show that brings our work in the legislature back home to Wyndham County. Now we're doing this remotely as we've been doing our legislative work and will in the next session because COVID is still out there. COVID is active, it's real, and it's killing people. And I just wanna take a, a moment to recognize and send our condolences to the speaker of the New Hampshire House, Speaker Hinch, who died last week of COVID. Uh, it was a stark reminder that COVID is there, it's lethal, and we need to take precautions. Uh, so please be safe out there. What we're asking people to do is for everybody's safety. So it makes common sense for us to look at the common good and, and do what we can to, to make this a, a, a safe end of year into next year. So we're getting ready for the 2021 session. And today's guest is Representative Emily Kornheiser of Brattleboro. Welcome, Emily. Thanks, Mike. Uh, it's good to see you remotely, uh, but as we were just talking about earlier, uh, I do miss, and I think we both miss, uh, the personal interactions we have at the State House and the cross-pollination of ideas that, that can happen when, when we're talking with other people. Do you have thoughts on how it's been for you and what you're looking forward to in that regard? Um, there are pieces of the remote work that I really enjoy. Um, I find that actually having a full desk in front of me is very good for my organization. I don't know if that's true for you. When we're in the legislature, we're bouncing between three or four different very small work surfaces. Um, and I love that constituents can watch all that we do on YouTube, on Zoom. I think that's a really incredible thing. I find that for statewide meetings that I'm at, a lot of folks from down our way can participate who might not have otherwise. I think that's wonderful. And so I'm hoping we can carry all these things into the post-pandemic realm. I do miss um, the more casual conversations though and what they mean for our ability to sort of understand complex issues, to sort of you know correct misunderstandings um, gently. I think it's much easier to be gentle in person than it might be online. Um, and so while I'm really excited for what we're gonna take on this biennium, I do have some concern that doing the hard work is going to, you know, and having those really tough conversations to get to compromise is gonna be even harder when we can't um, sort of moderate in person. Yeah, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying. And I think one of the benefits of that is uh, we're, we're not working uh, in a bubble. Mm -hmm. We're working with our colleagues and we're working with uh, people who are often opposed to specific ideas, some in our own party. And, and we do get the benefit, I think a lot of our constituents don't, to have the give and take with people who don't agree with us all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like it, it fleshes out my own perspective on things and, and I appreciate that and I think it's sometimes harder for people who don't get that to understand uh, how, how helpful it can be to hear dissenting perspectives and I know uh, you know Democrats have large majorities there's twice as many Democrats in the House as Republicans but we still want to hear from them mm -hmm. and uh, it's important for us to, to, to make the process work and that's the way the founders wanted it majority rule but minority is brought into everything. Now, um, we're looking at a different landscape in, in the year ahead. Um, COVID has changed everything, but you know, on, on the, the good side of things, Vermont's numbers continue to do better than other states, even during the surge. And, and we heard a uh, economic briefing uh, a couple of weeks ago now by the economist Tom Cavett that there's connections between health and safety and a thriving economy. And one of the things um, before you were switched over to the Ways and Means Committee, you were on the Commerce Committee. And I know that's still very important to you. So looking ahead to COVID recovery, um, what are some of the things that you, you feel we should be doing? Well, I think one of the interesting pieces of um, our state economist Tom Kavett's presentation and something I've been really aware of through this pandemic is um, that the pandemic isn't 
impacting each of us in the same way. Um, it's really has expanded existing gaps in our system um, and has expanded sort of um, different people's experiences of the economy. And so one piece of that, um, in addition to really helping us even more understand the need for early care and education, um, the you know, value of our school system, um, our healthcare system, things like family medical leave, but also there's um, this pandemic is the particular type of recession that it's causing um, means that we're going to have a K-shaped recovery, which is so geeky and hard to visualize. But what it basically means is folks who are already sort of in the bottom quartile or sort of lower income folks um, are experiencing one, even more economic instability, right? Low wage workers, some of them are essential workers um, and are continuing to work and putting their health at risk. And some of them lost jobs because they're working in the service industry. And those jobs are gonna be very slow to recover. Whereas folks who are working more white collar jobs tend to still be employed and spending less money. Um, and so what we've seen is what we already had an enormous income gap in this country that's going, that's continued to grow throughout the pandemic and will grow even more post pandemic. Um, and so the implications for that for policymaking are really huge for me because it means that we have space um, to, you know, get some more tax revenue from certain segments of the population if we're careful about it. Um, it means that we need to be very, very aware that we're not going to further impact folks who are already struggling. And it means that when we think about what rebuilding the economy looks like post pandemic, I want us to be careful that we're really not just thinking about sort of revenue for revenue's sake, but we're really saying like, what would an economy that worked for all of us look like, right? Like really viscerally, what does that feel like and look like? Like what are the jobs that are dignified and that pay enough for people to make it work and that people can care for their kids and their family and their loved ones, like what? We have a chance to sort of re-envision something because there's no way we can go back to what we had before. And so that feels very exciting to me, um, even though the uncertainty is um, just as present. Yeah, well, those, are, those are points well taken that uh, it's turned almost into a cliche that mm -hmm. Don't let a crisis go by without taking advantage of the opportunities and that's that is one of the opportunities and you know the you're right this this k-shaped recovery uh is is amplifying the disparities and and i know one of the things that especially as democrats we're especially concerned about are our middle and working class vermonters mm -hmm. uh, they have struggled um, sometimes Getting up to, to middle class means you have two people working two jobs, uh, and or more. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just to pay the bills. So, we want to make sure uh, we we build an economy that works for everyone, especially those people that are working hard and and struggling. I think it's been said somebody that works forty hours a week shouldn't need public assistance. They shouldn't need to get extra help. And yet that's the reality out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I agree with you and, and look forward to working together on, on how we can make this economy work for everyone. Um, you know, I'm gonna shift a little bit away from that uh, because you, you wear a number of hats that are important things that happen here. And uh, you've, you've been on the Vermont Women's Commission. Uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit about the commission its history and what they do. And then that's gonna lead into another question, but if you could start there. Mm -hmm. So there are commissions on women, um, I believe in every state in the country. Um, Hawaii's just did some really interesting COVID recovery work if anyone wants to spend some time looking that up. Um, and so we were created in statute to really um, advocate and look out for the rights of women in Vermont. And we've been doing that for quite a while. Um, each position on the commission is appointed some are appointed by the governor and some are appointed by the Speaker of the House or the Senate pro tem. And um, we meet once a month. We have, there's a small staff um, and we really work to further the position of women in Vermont. 
And that can so, include everything from sort of educational equity to health equity to economic equity. Um, the project Change the Story, which has done some really interesting work on economic yeah. equity, is a project of the Vermont Commission on Women. So, um, right, rightfully so, uh, racial and social justice has had a focus on, on racial justi justice because of some um, ongoing systemic racism, the need for police reform, and some very uh, highly public uh, murders uh, of, of, of African American men. Um, before that, though, there was uh, the Me Too movement was something that was gaining prominence of, of a problem that's as old as civilization, that the reality that uh, women are not treated very well in the workplace, starting with the, is it 72 cents on the dollar? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it depends on what um, race you are actually, but yes, um, yeah. Oh, is that, oh, so it's yeah. less for? It's significantly less for um, African-American women, for Asian-American women, for um, Latin American yeah. women, and then um, Native American women, I think are actually the, um, I think it's somewhere in the 40 cents on the dollar. Yeah. My goodness. Mm -hmm. So um, that work hasn't gone away. And one of the things, uh, there was a greater emphasis not that long ago in the legislature, including pieces like, um, I think negating, um, please help me with the term, agreements, non-disclosure agreements, is that it? Yeah, there was some work on non-disclosure agreements um, around sexual harassment and sexual assault cases. I think we did some work on um, salary history, which is a really interesting component of equal pay legislation. And I think there was also, a we passed um, some legislation, this was all the biennium before I joined, um, but I think there was some legislation about a right to request a flexible schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, these are certainly concerns that haven't gone away. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that we can do more than one thing at once. So are there <laughs> concerns too. that the Women's Commission is advocating for now that you, you're hoping we can address in the next session? Mm -hmm. And I, um, I think a lot of that is sort of what I was talking about with the K-shaped recovery um, and the impact of the pandemic. So we know that the pandemic um, further created these gaps. And so specifically, we know that women were, especially single mothers, were incredibly impacted by the pandemic. So the, in September, the first month of the school year, the vast, vast majority of folks who filed new unemployment claims or were newly out of work were women. Because we know that given how incredibly complicated child raising has become in the pandemic with school schedules changing and um, support networks narrowing, um, women are leaving the workforce. Even women in two gender households um, are leaving the workforce, it tends to be women who leave when one member of the family has to leave. Um, so issues uh, around childcare and around access to work that works with family um, are huge for the Commission on Women and really like specific to the pandemic. And then other places um, around issues of sexual harassment and sort of you reference the Me Too movement and a lot of that at this point, the movement has really shifted from these very high image, high power, high octane findings, you know, movie stars and comedians and journalists and whatever it is, to really looking at what um, average working women experience. And so the experience of people with less power in the workplace and what that looks like in terms of sort of chronic sexual harassment and sexual assault. Restaurants in the hospitality industry are fairly famous for this, how the tipped wage really creates an environment um, that puts a lot of pressure on women to get along not just with customers in terms of the tips, but also gives tremendous power to management and the, the backside of the restaurant that's sort of the kitchen um, around issues of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Because the wages sit so tightly with everyone getting along all the time. 
And so that's an issue that came up when we look at minimum wage and sort of one tipped wage, um, one sort of one general wage for everyone. Um, I don't think we're expecting much movement on that this biennium, but it would be lovely if we could. Um, family medical leave is a big issue um, and really making sure that people take equal family leave regardless of gender, because that makes a big difference for people's experience in the workforce long term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those are some of the things. Um, and I wish I had it. I know that I took some time off when my daughters who are now in their thirties mm -hmm. were, were children to stay home with them and help with the raising. And uh, probably the best experiences I've had, I hope it was good for them. <laughs> um, but for me, it was a wonderfully enjoyable and educational time to be able to stay home with, with my kids full time when they were young. Yeah, there is a really, it's an interesting sort of systemic piece of how it relates to long term wages for women. It's, um, you know, you doing that means that you formed habits of caretaking um, that shift sort of the long term landscape in your household around who the default <coughs> caregivers in certain situations, which means that, you know, maybe when your girls were seven and they had to leave school for a doctor's appointment, you felt more responsible for that in your household, right? And so that's sort of the long-term impacts on how someone shows up at work around prime, you know, caretakers. Um, and then there is how your employer experiences that because you're forming habits with your employer around that kind of caretaking. It's yeah. a really, um, it's an interesting piece. And in Europe where it's mandated that both genders take the exact same amount of leave, we've seen a lot of movement around pay equity. Yeah. Now, going back to the tipped wage piece, mm -hmm. Uh, did New York change their law on tipped wages? Whew. California did um, and has sort of gone back and forth with it. Yeah. Um, I think New York City did something different from the rest of the state, and I'm not quite sure what it is, Mike. I just remember there was two different things. Yeah, I, I think they created areas in the state where they raised it, but raised it different mm -hmm. in New York City than they did uh, up on the Canadian border. So, but it makes sense to me. And uh, certainly when I hear businesses right now um, clamoring for more staff, this is one of the things that I think they might be able to do to, to entice people to, to work there. Um, onto the legislature itself. Mm -hmm. And Last year, you we don't have our committee assignments. We don't. Yet. It makes all of these conversations very hard lately. It is. <laughs> are you are you hoping to be back on Ways and Means? I am hoping to be on Ways and Means. I um, yeah. appreciate how it touches the work of so many mm -hmm. different committees. I think that's really exciting and helps me understand sort of the big picture of policy. Um, yeah. I was talking to someone a year or two ago about um, sort of the box that we make policy from. And while people generally think of appropriations in the budget making process as sort of where the hardest decisions happen, they're all operating in the box that was created by the revenue that Ways and Means creates. And so I appreciate yeah. being as sort of upstream as possible because um, I think that's where so many solutions can come. Yeah. And the last reason that I love Ways and Means, which is super geeky, is that I genuinely think that taxes are sort of why we formed a civilization, that it's the idea that we are pooling our separate resources for the collective good. And that's very meaningful to me. And so it's meaningful to me to try to help um, more people see taxes from that sort of public collective good perspective. Yep, I, I would agree. And I think uh, in, way back in the last century, uh, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis issued that famous quote that taxes are the price we pay for a civilized society. Mm -hmm. So uh, I agree and I think it's important. I'm glad to see you're on there. The other piece, uh, you get to work with the chair, uh, Janet Anso, and it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity because she's somebody who once headed the tax department when she worked for Governor Dean. And here she is uh, using that expertise to help craft policy as well. So. We have a pretty amazing leadership team uh, in the house, including people like Janet Ansel. Absolutely. I mean, the amount um, that is 
sort of available to her as someone, the amount of knowledge that's available to her and that I am looking forward to continuing to learn from is incredible. She's worked as legislative counsel. She worked as tax commissioner. She has you know, been the chair of the committee for a little while. It's really been incredible to see all the different angles that she's able to come from when looking at legislation. And I love soaking that up. Yeah, yeah. Now, in terms of legislation for the coming year, apart from that committee, although this, the, there's very few things that don't touch either appropriations or ways and means. You mentioned uh, paid family leave before. Mm -hmm. Uh, is this something you're hoping we get to look at again this this session? I am. I'm aware that we're going to have um, more limited bandwidth than we would previously. And so I'm looking forward to finding ways for us to really embrace our political courage together in this time that I think Vermonters really require that of us. Um, so, yep, I'm looking forward to working on family medical leave, um, looking forward to strengthening our child care system or early care and education system, both in terms of getting higher wages to folks who work in that system and then making it more affordable and available for um, parents who need it and caregivers who need it. Um, there's a, as a chair of the workers caucus, the working Vermonters caucus, I am looking forward to also advancing some legislation to protect workers, um, employees during COVID and then um, after. So some of that is sort of safety issues, some of that is collective bargaining issues, and some of that is really, again, saying, if the, you know, what aspects do we need in a workplace to make it a place where the people who work there can thrive too? That should be the purpose of our economy. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we're, we're both clear that we certainly wanna help businesses out of the, the hole that COVID, um, but we need to make sure that the the workers mm -hmm. who drive those businesses as much as anything um, are, are well well taken care of and and are strong considerations in the business plans that the the, the businesses put forward absolutely and i think any employer would say that their um you know their business wouldn't function without their employees and so i want to make sure that we're helping employers really think about what is the best environment for employees to be thriving and contributing sure the moving ahead the reality that we're, we're going to see i believe is um we're going to have a different president but the senate is true. not gonna, we, we don't know about the senate yet and there's a strong possibility the Senate's not going to change. Mm -hmm. And um, looking back to when President Obama was in office, uh, there was very little cooperation uh, between the Senate and, and the president. So not a lot got done. President Obama was able to help dig us out of the last recession. And I think President Biden will too. But how that manifests for the states may be we're not going to get the kind of help we might get if we had a Democratic Senate. So um, how do you see that the challenges of, you know, a diminished income for the state and wanting to do more things? That's a tough balancing act. It's a really tough balancing act. Um, I have been really heartened to learn much more about what can happen on the federal level through executive action. You know, for instance, student loan forgiveness. That's really like that's, that is very sparkly for me, both personally and politically. Um, so I th I'm hopeful that Obama's particular perspective on um, sort of compromise and um, teamwork um, and places that that strategy fell short, I'm hoping that Biden learned some lessons from that um, and that we can see more political courage in the face of a gridlocked Congress. Um, but if we do not get further COVID relief funds from the feds, I do think it's going to be a really tough year. And so I hope that as a legislature, we can take a serious look at where in our, um, where do we have opportunities for more revenue um, so that we can bring more, you know, more money into the state um, for essential services. And then where have we been spending money historically that we spend money because it makes us feel good or because um, it tells a story that we think people want to hear rather than where are we spending money to make the greatest impact for the greatest number of Vermonters who need it the most. And so yeah. I'm looking forward to those conversations. Yeah, now one of the things you've done some good work on is helping all of us take a deeper look 
about legislation that we want to pass, but the, the, the government accountability committee work mm -hmm. and the document that you've given to us on the process to go through, to be thoughtful about all the ramifications uh, of, of legislation we pass. Now, as somebody who's worked in, in the nonprofit sector, I'm well aware of when you're writing a grant, it's similar to writing a business plan, except they want to know some more details uh, about how you're going to sustain things. But basically, they want to know what you're going to do and, and how are you going to do it and how are you going to show that you, you actually accomplished what you wanted to. Could you speak a little bit to the Government Accountability Committee and, and that process, the GAC document, as we say? Sure, yeah. Um, so on the Government Accountability Committee, we have a focus on helping the legislature really live up to a set of outcomes for Vermonters that we put in statute a number of years ago. And that's very important, but I think for most of us in this hum of our daily lives, it's hard for us to pause and say, how is what I am doing individually as a legislator leading towards these really big picture outcomes about Vermonters being healthy and sustained and stuff like that. And so with a colleague um, from the Agency of Human Services, Drew Wesley, I created a series of documents with the Government Accountability Committee to really ask legislators to ask those questions of themselves. And so why are you proposing a piece of legislation? Who will be impacted by that legislation? How will you know if you're effective or not? And really to just like think through um, the sort of nonprofit ease on it as your theory of change. Why do you think that this is a good idea <laughs> and why might not it be a good idea? And it seems very simple and straightforward when I say it like that. Um, but I think in the sort of the tumult of legislative happenings and the stories that we're often very captive to, it's hard to take that pause and ask those questions. And so I'm hopeful that that will sort of develop further in our decision-making process. Yeah, well, th thanks for your work on that. It's, it's, it's been helpful and enlightening, I think, for a lot of us. I share it with constituents now when really? I get a request for a bill. Well, not exactly, but I share the, the sort of the template of the thought process that needs to go, which, has to be more than tapping me on the shoulder when you see me on the street and say, hey, do this. Uh -huh. I, I, I want people to know. And I say, help me answer these questions. Mm -hmm. if, if you, you know, I need you to put some thought into this as well so we can actually make this happen. Um, there's, there's no magic wand we have. And the idea of getting a bill from idea to finish is, is a pretty difficult thing. And, uh, I usually meet with, with school children and, and we do an exercise. Um, it was just the last month I was outdoors with the fourth grade at Putney Central School. And we, we, we do an exercise that I call naming a state food. Mm -hmm. And usually if there's 15 kids in the class, you get 15 ideas of what should happen. But how do you make that decision as mm -hmm. a group by voting? And it takes a while and I think it shows them what we need in our process in the legislature is even more complex. So, And that's why I really love this um, decision-making document because it helps us, I think, step a little bit outside of our personal strategy about why we should do something and helps us come to really good quality compromises and understanding that we're all aiming for that same thing up there. And so maybe we can be more flexible on the how if we can agree on the why. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a... It's, it's a good point. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, though, and this is a time of year where it's helpful for people to know how to get in touch with us if they have ideas, comments, questions, and uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is by going to my website, emilykornheiser.org. Even if you spell it wrong, I promise you'll be able to find your way to it. I'm the only one. And on there, you can find my legislative email, you can find my phone number, you can find all my social media accounts, but that's sort of the best place to start to go further. Yeah, so I think what will happen is before we get this on, on the air, and BCTV, they'll put that information in, in writing too. But uh, this is a good time of year to get in touch with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're preparing to get ready for, for business. We've had our meetings uh, right through into the new year, and we're looking forward to to the new session. So I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks and, for doing uh, this show, Mike. It's great. Yeah, well, I think it's one of our jobs to make this information known to constituents. 
And I especially want to thank people at BCTV for helping this happen. Um, BCTV is one of those entities whose importance has been amplified during COVID. And I uh, am much appreciative of, of all the people working hard to, to give people at home a little bit more to see and to know in, as, as we move ahead. So thanks to them. Thanks to you, Emily. And thanks to you for watching. Until next time, bye-bye now. Mm -hmm.